and at now at the Institute for Policy Studies. Her new book, which I'm reading, is Six Stops on the National Security Tour, Rethinking Warfare Economies. Miriam, please go ahead. It's great to be with you all. Um, I am really grateful that uh, Veterans for Peace is working on organizing around climate change, the, the connection between climate change and militarism. Uh, that's what I've been working on for a long time now. Um, and there are lots of uh, ways to go at it, but um, mainly what I, what I do is look through the lens of budget priorities and industrial policy. That is, you know, uh, what, the gov what government policy prioritizes in terms of, internet, of uh, industrial development. So I'll try to flesh that out with a few slides for you now. Okay. Can we see the whole, okay, there we go. Um, so uh, there's that book she was talking about. Um, and the question is, is it possible to turn our military, militarized economy toward fighting the climate crisis? Next slide. I uh, may as well start with uh, the um, comparison between the United States military budget and uh, the next nine countries put together it's actually, uh, this is from 2021, it's actually uh, got worse and going to get worse probably this year. Um, and if we uh, look at the um, at the top one of, in that stack, that is China, uh, we know that the military budget uh, is being, uh, you know, the increase is being promoted as we need to, you know, resist the rise of China. Um, but what we're reading now is that uh, the Chinese economy is in a lot of trouble. Um, and uh, even now it is um, about, uh, we are, the US is spending about two and a half times what China uh, is spending. So um, increasing our military uh, spending, you know, whatever you think about what the China threat might be, um, increasing our military budget is, is um, you know, just simply doesn't make sense. Next slide. So um, a colleague of mine uh, who runs the National Priorities Project that you um, may have run into, um, she's done a, um, uh, a rundown of uh, the, what she calls the uh, militarized portion of the federal government. And she's, um, outlined um, all the different components of that, starting with Department of Defense, but also looking down, uh, obviously, the nuclear weapons complex, uh, foreign military aid, and then we get to veterans benefits. This is, by the way, um, just the discretionary portion of the budget. So there's discretionary, what Congress votes on every year, and then there are the mandatory um, expenditures. And so uh, when we talk about veterans benefits, these are just the ones that Congress votes on. They're all obviously uh, a lot of other, um, you know, a, a, a larger portion of, of mandatory benefits. But this, this, is, this is what's in the uh, militarized uh, federal budget. Um, so then, then we get down to, um, uh, you know, uh, so-called border protection. Uh, which is to say uh, detention and and deportation. Um, and so there are uh, all of those components of the budget. Um, and then finally, we get to federal law enforcement. So uh, mass incarceration, um, DEA, <clears throat> all of those. Not to say that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be spending uh, money on, the, on some of these uh, components of the budget. Um, but can we go to the next slide? Uh, what she shows is that um, these components make up 62% of um, the discretionary federal budget. Um, and then you see all of those other little slices for things like energy and environment, uh, education, transportation, and the whole uh, range. So. Um, you know, our budget is, is uh, you know, skewed toward uh, militarism and, um, you know, the, these on the left-hand side are all the 
uh, priorities that are being neglected. Next slide. So this is, you may have seen this, this is um, this mountain range, as I call it, um, is the trajectory of military spending uh, after World War II. And so, so you see um, the, the uh, peaks uh, that are all these wars, plus the Reagan military uh, buildup. And what you notice about this mountain range is that you get these peaks, but uh, after the peak, you never get back to where you were. Um, this is all adjusting for inflation. This is uh, this is not related to inflation, but uh, after every war, um, uh, we don't ever come down to what to where we were beforehand. Um, and and if you look at the Reagan buildup, you'll see that we had uh, the biggest drop in military spending. Um, uh, which was obviously um, caused by the implosion of our Cold War enemy. Um, but you see that uh, that drop didn't last very long. And um, uh, it, so the little shelf um, on the upward trajectory is 9-11. Is, um, so uh, we were already going steeply upward and then of course we reached Everest up there, which is the Afghan and Iraq wars. Um, the, the, uh, the map hasn't been extended to the present day or certainly to what's happening with the budget wars uh, this year, um, but we're probably going to um, exceed that previous Everest with a new Everest now. Uh, next slide. Um, so um, in the book, I talk a lot about um, the various ways that uh, the contractors made sure that uh, that drop in the military budget, which they didn't like at all, um, was reversed. And so there's a couple different ways we can talk about campaign contributions um, to key members of the committees that vote on military spending in, in Congress. Um, but I think the most uh, important thing they did um, after the Cold War, and they've been doing it for a long time, but they really ramped up their effort um, to spread contracts as far and as wide across the American landscape as they could. Um, and this is obviously not a recipe for industrial efficiency, but it, it's certainly a recipe for political protection, which is what they've been buying. So here's um, the, um, uh, we have the F-35 fighter jet, the uh, most expensive, uh, boondoggle that the Pentagon has ever has ever funded. Um, the last uh, report from the General Accounting Office um, found 800 uh, defects in the F-35, but um, you know they're already pushing them out, and then they get more money to fix them once once uh, once they're already uh, out there. Um, so this is a map of those those four stars. On those four states um, are the only four states that do not have a piece of the F-35 fighter jet program. So um, they have, as I say, um, bought immense political protection by um, by this means. Uh, next slide. So I decided to go and visit um, a few of uh, these uh, defense dependent locations. Um, and this is this is where I went. Um, next slide. So here we are at uh, Los Alamos. I, I went up there on the Mesa, which we've all watched in the movies lately, um, uh, to to look at the place where the nuclear age was born and where it is being now perpetuated. Next slide. I also went down to um, a uh, a military base in the one of in the poorest quadrant of the state of Arkansas, one of the poorest states. Um, this is where the U.S. stockpiled much of its chemical weapons, um, uh, its chemical weapons stockpiles, and um, and are now and have been storing them. And that was uh, what the community built its economy around because it was the only thing really going in that town of Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Um, but then in the early 90s came the Chemical Weapons Convention and the US was required to 
uh, get rid of all of its stockpiles of chemical weapons. And so uh, now this community mainstay uh, just went away and they've been struggling ever since to, um, to find another way to um, support economic development in this very poor uh, city. Uh, next slide. This is this was um, on an air base in north of LA, the mountains over over um, uh, from LA, um, and this air base houses oddly um, three of the five major prime contractors. So Lockheed is there, Boeing is there, um, and Northrop Grumman is there. And this was Northrop Grumman's uh, music and light show when it uh, unveiled its, uh, the, this, new, um, this new bomber. Uh, it was quite, quite the production, but then you know, they just took it back uh, into the hangar because it really isn't ready to, to, um, be, to be used and um, you know, is certainly uh, not, not needed. Um, uh, it's got all this stealth uh, technology on it that um, as uh, they've been trying to perfect this stealth, stealth technology so that it wouldn't um, uh, be, be um, detectable by radar. Um, but of course, uh, the technology doesn't really work and they and and you know, so these planes uh, can't really, as we once said, go out in the rain. Uh, so next slide. Um, I chose the places I visited, um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons to, to, you know, uh, look at different pieces of the military industrial complex. Um, but in each case, um, I was also looking for, uh, you know, the potential of that area, um, to get its piece of the green economy. So this is right on that air base with Boeing and Northrop and, um, and Lockheed um, is a factory that is making the, um, the light rail cars for the city of Los Angeles. It's a, it's a, um, a Japanese company um, called Kinky Shario um, and uh, you know, indicating that uh, you know, Los Angeles wants these rail cars um, but they couldn't find an American manufacturer to, to make them. Uh, next slide. Um, so, oh, I missed, well, anyway. Um, so there we go. <laughs> um, this, I'll be brief. This is um, my best example of a sword being converted into a plowshare. Um, this is a was formerly a Lockheed facility. Then it was bought by BAE Systems, another major prime contractor, um, in Binghamton, New York. And um, they figured the engineers there, uh, when the Cold War was um, making even Lockheed think about what else they might be able to do besides build uh, weapons platforms. Um, and they got got their engineers to work on this, and the engineers figured out how to get a hydraulic system that they'd been working on in a fighter jet and use it and adapt it um, to run the drivetrain of a hybrid electric bus. And there are now these buses on uh, the streets of New York and Tokyo and London and you know scores of other places around the world. Um, however, uh, the um, that facility, you know, this bus manufacturing uh, facility is about 5% of what BAE does. Mostly it does weapons platforms still. So um, these, such, these cases um, such as this one uh, are hard to find. I had to work very hard to, to find this one. Um, uh, so what is really needed to replicate um, this success story across the country is a real change in industrial policy. So we have a de facto uh, militarized industrial policy uh, created by all of this uh, spending on, uh, on the military and uh, on private contractors across the country. Um, so um, 
uh, let's see, go to the next slide. Uh, we have the best um, green industrial policy that we've ever had uh, through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, uh, we can, uh, let's go to the next um, slide. These are all the things it's done. Um, and uh, so this is the beginnings of a change to a climate focused industrial policy. And, uh, you know, a reminder of what our military industrial uh, policy, um, you know, what its nature is, is entirely funded by the taxpayers. Um, however, the, the, a, the climate focused industrial policy whose beginnings are being created by the Inflation Reduction Act um, is using federal money um, to, um, to boost private investment. And that is um, happening, you know, at a, at a really impressive scale right now. Uh, private sector announced more than 110 billion in new energy manufacturing investments, including 70 billion in electric vehicle supply chain and more than 10 billion in solar manufacturing. Next slide. However, <laughs> uh, we got to put that, you know, it's a very important program, a very exciting program, but we have to put it in perspective. Um, that little orange slice is um, uh, the amount of money being invested every year in the Inflation Reduction Act, as opposed to that blue pie, uh, which is, uh, you know, is, is the military budget. And in fact, um, probably this this disparity is going to get going to get worse this year. Next slide. I want to say a word about um, the jobs issue. So obviously uh, pouring military money into a uh, you know any community is going to create a lot of jobs. That is inevitable. Um, however, uh, you know a series of studies, some which you may have seen, um, uh, shows that while it does create a, uh, a lot of jobs, um, more money would be created by investing that money in, uh, in a whole range of other, other kinds of economic activity. Um, so, you know, education, uh, clean energy, um, uh, infrastructure, and, and so on. Uh, all of those uh, create more jobs than uh, investing that amount of money in the military. Next slide. So this this chart is a little bit hard to read, and and I'm sorry about that. Um, the I'll just explain the uh, dotted line across the middle um, is the uh, national poverty rate, so a little more than um, 10 percent. Um, the dark lines are the 20 most defense dependent states in the country. Um, and next to each dark line are the three most defense dependent uh, counties in that state. And uh, just briefly, what, what this shows is that while yes, uh, you pour military money into um, a community and uh, you, will, you will create a lot of jobs for, for some people, um, but uh, this is far from what the contractors would like you to believe, which is the, the idea that um, these all of this military money creates broad community prosperity. And what this shows is that in uh, about half the cases, um, those communities that are the most defense dependent in the country have a higher poverty rate than the national average. Uh, next slide. So, Three suggestions uh, for supporters of a climate-focused industrial policy. First would be to advocate for a shift in budget priorities and for um, you know boosting this this climate-focused uh, uh, industrial investment that the IRA is is beginning to create. Uh, second uh, would be I think people should be pushing their local legislate legislators. Um, to push for their community's piece of the IRA pie, saying, you know, what are you doing to get some of this money and to create an alternative um, uh, economic base to, um, you know, to this militarized uh, economic base that um, uh, far too many communities have. And finally, uh, to push for unionization 
at local uh, clean technology projects. Um, I think you all know more about this than I do, but but um, it's clear that that this is going to have to be a fight, and it's one that is well worth worth having. So um, I appreciate the time um, that you've given me, and I so appreciate the work you're doing. And um, you know, be happy to be happy to take any questions whenever.